welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, uh, where today's guest is the one and only James Goss. Um, James is the author of uh, a, a, the, the, the novelization of uh, Douglas Adams' City of Death, as well as many other Doctor Who books. While at the BBC, James produced an adaptation of Sharda, the, the famous unfinished um, Douglas Adams tale. And very recently, actually, one of the things James and I have worked together on was the Time Lord Victorious event, which uh, James very successfully created for the BBC. James, how are you? I am fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And it's always delightful to see you. Thank you for joining us today. We're, we're talking about something truly exciting, which is the latest brace of uh, Target Doctor Who paperback releases, including your adaptation of Douglas Adams' The Pirate Planet. Yes, if I'd thought about this, I'd have got all of my Target novels on the bookshelves behind me and I'd have scored lots of points. Yeah, that would have been amazing. Now, mate, I'm going to decon just go back a few steps before we get into talking about those wonderful Target novels, which, by the way, anybody watching this can, can order from the links attached to this interview. But as, as, a, as a Doctor Who fan going way back, what was your first experience of Doctor Who? My first experience of Doctor Who? I can't... Um, I think it would have been end of Tom Bates, you know, coherently knowing Doctor Who is Doctor yeah. Who. I think it was that nice man who climbed a hill and died. Um, so I, I think I, you know, I had a conscious awareness of Doctor Who. Um, it's sort of the first childhood autumn I can remember. Um, that That's about it, really. Um, I think it. I think I thought it was magical. And, and when did you first become truly engaged in the show? What era was your was your era, and who was your favourite Doctor, and why? Uh, I, I think I first became massively engaged with the show um, the the Peter Davison era, because you have to remember it was it was very exciting, and all the kids would still play Doctor in the playground because it was on twice a week. Uh, which is an extraordinary thing. And it was on an awful lot of the year and it was terribly fun and all consuming. Um, and then um, I, I remember on, on one holiday, cause we, we had, um, this is the thing you're probably old enough to remember, but only in the sense of going, Oh, they don't know what they're getting. Um, but I remember the five faces of doctor who season, Absolutely. Um, which was life changing. The idea that the BBC sort of showed, at least one story from each existing doctor um, o over a period of weeks. And you just went, oh, my word, this is this is some form of like fan juice. Um, and then the next year they then showed Doctor Who and the Monsters. So you got to see Genesis of the Daleks and the Curse of Peladon um, and, and probably Earthshock again, because back in those days, they would show Earthshock at every available opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it was a really magical time to be a Doctor Who fan. It was a time before video recorders. Uh, you know, I'm sure so that there's a real sense of event every time stuff is broadcast, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, it, 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 the idea that this this stuff went out and, you know, you, you were vaguely aware that there was one posh kid in school who had a video recorder, but you didn't realise how that would connect to the likes of you ever. It was just something magical that floated past several times a week and sometimes in the school holidays. Yeah. I, 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 I remember those times well myself. And indeed, you know, I remember an era a decade before the one that you're talking about. Um, what, now, I take it that you were a fan of the Target books from some time ago, right? Yes. I mean, when, when I was a kid, um, it, it was this mad thing of uh, being on holiday in Porlock Weir um, and going down to the... Uh, the little shop on Porlock Weir Harbour and suddenly discovering amongst the postcards on one of those um, whirling dervish things. That, the spinner uh, racks, yeah. Yep, yeah. and there was a Doctor Who book and I could not quite understand this because it said it was Doctor Who and the Visitation and I was so terribly excited and I took it home uh, and I read it a dozen times and I know that seems like, you know, an exaggeration, but that was, you know, I read it a dozen times and then I went back because I was like, well, there was one Doctor Who book. Maybe there's another Doctor Who book. And then I discovered there was Doctor Who and the Monster of Peladon. And I'd only seen Doctor Who and the Curse of Peladon on TV. And the idea that there was a sequel. So then that got read another <laughs> yeah, dozen right. times. Yeah. Um, 
because I was like, this is so incredibly exciting because I had no idea what this was, except that, you know, there seemed to be two Doctor Who books and there might be more. And, you know, at that point, the, the doors had yet to open and I had yet to realise the vast cornucopia of there being 150 of these mad things <laughs> out there. Um, and, you know, spending the rest of my childhood happily scouring car boot sales and jumble sales and that weird man on Finmere Market, just in case he had Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon, you know, just the magic of these things and the incredible portability of them. Um, you know, there there is something to be said for, um, you know, obviously I've got one copy, but the size of these things, the portability of them, the fact they fitted perfectly in a jacket pocket, it's it's a size of book that was invented by Penguin. I think that's pretty much true because Penguin went, oh, soldiers can fit those in their jacket pockets when they're off to the front. Brilliant. Um, people at train stations can fit those in a pocket. It's great. It doesn't ruin the cut of your coat. And they invented portable reading. You know, everything about e-readers that we have now are still aspiring to the lightweight portability of these that format of paperback book and they were just perfect books for school children to read you know they were the perfect length of book um and when you look back at them you know realizing that doctor and the abominable snowman which is one of the best of the range terence dix manages to tell an incredible epic uh, about an ancient intelligence invading a Tibetan monastery using robot Yeti. And he manages to tell this beautiful epic story in 20,000 words, which is astonishing. Um, you know, they, they really are well, works of wonder. Um, and, you know, at, at the time when you're a child, trying to explain it, it's, it's just the joy when you're a child of discovering, oh my word, there are seven Narnia books. This is brilliant. How am I ever going to read seven Narnia books? And then sort of looking at Doctor Who and going, there are how many? And especially that 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 awful teetering point when as a child you actually run out of new ones. <laughs> and you run out of books that you can read a dozen times. And you start to look wider. That is the, the incredible contribution of the target books to my generation, that it created habitual readers because once you'd marched through all the target books, you were picking up any book that you could read. You know, on holidays, I would march through my mum's Catherine Cookson books, which would mean every now and then I'd go, mum, what's an abortion? And my mum would be like, you're nine. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was that real sort of uh, incredibility of these wonderful books that they created people who just instinctively, wherever they were, whenever they were waiting to fill in time, would reach for a book. Because that's what Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk taught you, that you just had to reach for a book because there would always be an entire universe in your pocket. I think that is such an incredibly well-made point and perhaps the, the best testament to what Target achieved and what all those great Doctor Who writers achieved. After all these interviews I've had so far, I think that's a very, very well-made point. Now, I, just, I, just, I just love them. And, um, you know, e even now as a proper grown-up adult, there, there is that sort of slight feeling whenever you pick up a book, if you're trying to work out more entertaining or less entertaining than slip back. Yeah. Do, do you have all of them, mate? Yes. I, I was going to ask if there are any that eluded you, and I began to realise as you were answering my previous question that you had to have all of them from the tone of that answer. And I'm very glad to hear that's the case. Have you got a favourite? Have you got a favourite two or three? Oh, I mean, The Abominable Snowman is, is definitely a favourite, right. um, yeah. partly because, you know, it's that, it's that sense feeling of, uh, you know, I can remember reading it in the back of a car, feeling terribly car sick, but also having to carry on reading because the robot Yeti were very exciting. Um, and obviously the monster of Peladon or the Visitation, they, they, they're very special because they were the first ones. And I think I've got the order in which I read them correct. Um, but there are so many brilliant ones because um, when I was working on um, Scratch Man with Tom Baker a couple of years ago, I decided I would just reread a lot of Target books to, to try and be in the mindset for evoking that era and um, just rediscovering things like, you know, you, you cannot fault Terence Dix. 
in terms of what Terence Dix is doing when Terence Dix is doing well is exceptional. Um, but just just the joy of a Malcolm Hulk. Um, his adaptation of The Green Death is very, very, very funny. Um, and, you know, there, there is a wonder um, to the, the prose style of a Malcolm Hulk. You know, Doctor in the Cave Monsters is a magical book that just delights in going, oh, this person didn't get much screen time on TV, but they're actually very important. Because what you have to realize is that she spent years nursing her mother until her mother died. And she's now dried up and miserable. And this is her, her last hope is to help the lizard people. And you go, oh, I had no idea about that. Um, you know, there, there are so many extraordinary books. So Donald Cotton's The Myth Makers is genuinely, brilliantly, chewily funny. Um, and takes a Doctor Who historical that you're a bit like, oh, that's going to be homework. Uh, and it's the least homeworky book in the Doctor Who range. Um, just as Eric Saywood suddenly turned up, because there's the early period Eric Saywood of Doctor Who and the Visitation, where there are no jokes. Oh, it's a very straightforward Eric Saywood adaptation. And then all of a sudden, there's the period of Eric Saywood of Doctor Who and the Twin Dilemma, and Doctor Who and the Slip Back, and Doctor Who and the Attack of the Sidemen, where you're just going, Oh, there are jokes in this, and yeah. that's beautiful. Um, you know, there's there are so many standout ones in the range. I was, um, oh, there it is. I, I was I was reading this last night for um, one of those inevitable Zoom quizzes, oh, Doctor yes. Who in the Underworld, and it's from Terence's thin period. Yeah. Um, when I think there was an editor who came in and went, "Oh, these books are looking a little bit long at 140 pages." Um, and the fact that, you know, you could read it and I'm like, like, yeah, I read this in like an hour and a bit. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and, you know, you, it, it's Terence at his most functional, uh, but it's still a very well written book, uh, you know, even when he is writing at that level. Um, you know, there, there are still phrases in there, like um, she woke up and found that she had been sentenced to life and you just go... You know, it's like Terence has the best opening line um, of any of the target books. And I, I'm going to ruin it now, but it is through the ruins of a deserted city staggered the ruins of a man. And you just go, congratulations. <laughs> uh, you know, there is so much in these books and it's very easy to just look at them and go, ah. um, because, you know, we've, we've all suffered through slightly mediocre, badly written tie in fiction, um, wow. which is a genre that's almost gone now. Um, yeah. But my God, they're such good books. Now, now on and in terms on moving on from that and focusing on perpetuating that legacy and celebrating that legacy, um, what was the genesis of you adapting Douglas Adams' The Pirate Planet for Target? And what are the key differences between the, his script and your novel? Oh, it's all, it's all very complicated. I brought along props. Uh, and Excellent. We'll that's, uh, that's what I want to... I'm glad you've done you've done so. We'll race through this quickly. Basically, in 2016, I wrote this, yeah. um, which is based on Douglas's first draft delivered to the BBC, which is a whacking 403-page uh, monster, because Douglas's first scripts were very, very long and full of ideas that the BBC couldn't possibly use. The target novelization is, oh, well, it's 183 pages, so it's not quite as short. Um, but, you know, th this is coming in at between 20 and 30,000 words. This is about 96,000 words, um, which, which sounds a bit self-indulgent, but there was an awful lot of unused Douglas Adams material to try and fit in. Um, but because this was based on the original scripts, um, rather than what was televised, uh, when it came to doing the adaptation, I thought, well, it's really easy. I'll just leave out all the scenes that aren't on TV. And it actually turned out to be much more complicated because even the scenes that were used were, were written completely differently. And when I was doing the original version of the book, I obviously favored unused material rather than used material so that people go, oh, I've never seen that joke before. As a Doctor Who fan, I now own this joke. Um, and the problem I found was that essentially I was just starting from scratch because I had this idea that I could just curl up in bed for a couple of afternoons with a pot of coffee, some curly whirlies, and just hack it down to 30,000 words, polish it a bit. But instead, I just found I was going, oh, 
this episode's completely different. Um, so it is a very, very different book. So if you've brought the 2016 version, um, this is not really a cut down version. There are a few times you go, oh, I recognize this, this, you know, I'm Facebook friends with this page, but we don't chat much. Uh, but there will be large chunks of it where you'll just go, oh, oh, he's put some work in. Um, and, you know, it, it was a lot more work than I thought um, just to try and get it true, but also keeping it true to what's televised, but also to the target approach, because the, the target approach is a very, um, it's quite a muscular stripped back style. It's more the Gospel of St. Mark than the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's much more sort of um, short, functional, punchy sentences, which required a lot of work to convey. Um, so things that, you know, in, in the long version where I've been a bit sort of purple prose, uh, <laughs> I'd had to very much sort of go, and then the spaceship crashed into the mountain. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's much more sort of finding that length and, and racing through stuff, um, but also expanding the world because the best of the target novels is when they sit down and they go, all right, on screen, we had a quarry and three extras. But because this is the book, this is what it's going to look like. So it's trying to fit the the wider lens of the target novelizations, but also keep it true to being an adaptation of the television series rather than being an adaptation of the original novelization of the first draft script, if that makes sense. It Ooh. makes complete sense and is very interesting. So to, to close on, James, what are you the most proud of about this novelization in this um, target iteration? The, the the terrible thing it fills a gap on the shelf Andrew <laughs> uh, that thing where I opened the packet and looked at it and went oh that's quite nice and then I picked yeah. it up and, and you, you know it's, it's almost like a race memory in my hand just picks up heads to the shelf and goes and it just slides in like the last piece of the key to time or it's just like the universe is now mine. That that that's that's all the gaps filled. That that weird fandom sense of completion, but also the Black Guardian doesn't turn up and go, well, uh, you know, I've now reset the universe or anything. You just go, <laughs> I've got a shelf full of an awful lot of books, yeah. and that's it. Um, but it, it, you know, the the quest is complete. Um, it, here, here, what a fantastic answer. That is that is brilliant. And you know, to see it bringing you the author so much pleasure, it is a wonderful thing to note. Yeah, I mean that you know it, it's such a privilege to be a part of it, and the idea that you know you know when people talk about time travel and they go, oh, I, I, you know, if I could go back and give my younger self piece of advice, you just go, you're gonna you're gonna get to adapt the Pirate Planet and City of Death to the target books, and little me would be like, ah, oh. like, <laughs> no, really, it's not just going to be cutting out little sheets of paper to make them the right size and then running them through your typewriter and putting said the doctor. It's actually going to happen. And, and little me would still be like, oh, wow. <laughs> but, you know, did it. That's, that's fine. Can <laughs> die now. And congratulations, mate. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's a beautifully packaged novelization, as you know. And, um, and anybody watching this interview can order it from the links attached to this interview. And this has been Forbidden Planet TV. And I've been talking to the highly animated, as always, James Goss about his extremely satisfying target novelization of The Pirate Planet by Douglas Adams. Thanks for joining us today, mate. Thank you. It's always great to see you. Take care of yourself. You too. Thank you so much. Sorry if I gabbed on, but we have finished within time, so it can't be that bad. No, it's all good. It's all good. Gab on. That's what I say. Take care of Bye. yourself, mate. You Bye -bye. too. Thanks very much, Andrew. See you soon. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.